see, where were we? Uh, yeah, we're talking about the limit. All right, so again, this is the beginning of higher math. This is the foundation of the calculus, the idea of the limit. Everything in calculus in the end all revolves around the limit and its properties and its consequences. Uh, what does it mean? So here's the symbol that we use, right? The limit as x approaches a of f of x is equal to l. A and l are numbers. A is the limit point. L is the limit value. What does this mean? Well, it means that as x gets closer to the value of a, the function values of f are getting closer to the value of l. Um, and here's a little picture that we drew. Uh, I'll show that, right? Here's my point a. I'm getting closer and closer to a coming in from the left-hand side. So here's the left-handed limit, right? I put a little minus sign here to show that I'm approaching a from the left-hand side. And in our two-dimensional space, there's two ways that we can approach x. We can approach it from the left or the right. Here's approaching x from the right-hand side. Uh, there's the right-hand limit, a little plus sign above the limit point to show that I'm on the right. And so what's happening, every time I get closer to A, in fact, you know, this drawing's not very good. It's kind of static. That's one thing that we have to remember is that the limit is a process. The limit can't be done in a single observation. You have to watch the behavior of the function over a sequence of steps. The more steps that you can include, uh, the better. And so uh, the limit itself, unlike most math problems that we encounter, it's not a static thing. It's a process. The answer to the limit problem is the solution to a uh, a sequence of steps. Um, here's a little thing I hope that's going to illustrate this a little bit more clearly. Where is it? Oh, great. I went all the trouble to load this and now it won't come up. And now it's gone. Oh, terrible. Okay, uh, what am I going to do? Uh, during the break, I'll see if I can find that again and bring it back up. Uh, let me see here. Where's my. Yeah, okay. So much for planning ahead. All right, uh, I, I do want to show you that because it's very difficult to illustrate this process by static drawing because it is a process and it is a sequence. So uh, I'll get that back, uh, at least give you a chance to see it. Okay, uh, so what do we determine about limits and their behavior? Uh, well, in one sense, the limit is a very uh, obvious concept. In most typical cases, the limit is no, the limit value is nothing more than the function value at the limit point. So here's a picture of a straight line. Uh, what's the limit as x approaches 2? Well, all I did was I plugged 2 into the formula for the function and I saw it, see what I get. And for most typical cases, that's exactly the way the limit works out. There's really no mystery to what happens. Uh, you know, uh, this is what we call evaluation by direct substitution. In fact, this is the way we'll start. Uh, we'll take our function, we'll plug in the limit point, and we'll see what we get. And if you get a real number in return, that's going to be the answer. So in these problems in example two, that's all I did. I used the limit point to evaluate the function. The result I got is the limit value. So uh, in a lot of ways, the limit is not very mysterious. In fact, what's mysterious about it is, you know, why would it be so powerful? If it's nothing... Uh, Besides the evaluation of functions, what do we need it for? What does it do for us that we couldn't do without it? And we started by looking at the pathological cases, the cases in which the limit process fails. And here was the first one. I think this is where we stopped. Yeah, this is the first one that we got to. Here's a function that has a gap in it, right? At some point within its domain, all of a sudden the function stops and then it takes up at a different point within the plane. Uh, so what happens here? Uh, well, uh, we're going to, we did the comparison between uh, the three different objects here. We looked at the actual function value itself. Right? The function value of this function is identified by this point. Right? This is the point 3, 3. The function value of 3 is equal to 3. And then we looked at the left and right hand limits. Uh, what's happening is I approach x from the two different directions. And what we see is that I'm coming in from the left-hand side, I'm climbing up along this branch of the curve, and I'm getting closer and closer to this cutoff point, but I'm never going to go beyond it. Uh, the closer I get to x, as long as I'm on the left, is this, that's as close as I can get. So I'm approaching 2. Right? The function values along this path are getting closer to 2. 
But as I come in from the right hand side, I'm coming from along this path in this direction. Now the cutoff point on top is at three. So the closer I get to three from the right hand side, the function values in cells are approaching three along the y axis. So the actual value of the limit along the left hand side or the right hand side is equal to three. And this is where things break down. From the left and the right, I get two different things. And that means that I'm not approaching any single value. And so here's our first example of the limit process breaking down. The limit does not exist here because I'm getting different results along my two paths. Okay, so this is number one. Uh, this is uh, the first case. And we're going to uh, look at this in different contexts as we go along. And by the way, at this point, we're looking at the uh, limit as a geometric uh, property. Right? We're looking at the geometric aspect of the limit. Uh, later on today, uh, we're going to look at the limit algebraically. But uh, the limit itself is most easily understood uh, through these diagrams and the geometry of what's happening here in our coordinate plane. Uh, okay, here's a second example of the limit process and a problem that we're going to encounter. Uh, this one actually turns out to be a little bit more important in the long run than the previous case, but let's look at this example. Um, oh, uh, about, oh, yeah, for, first of all, let's do it before. Uh, now, now, clearly, the problem is, uh, as it says here, this is a function that's got a hole in it. It doesn't have a gap, it's got a hole in it. Um, but, uh, you know, um, before we worry about that, uh, let's just ask a couple of questions. Uh, what is, I don't know, what is f of 4? equal to for this function? Three. Three, right? So here's, so f of four is the y coordinate of the point where x is equal to four. So here's the point four, three. And so in this case, f of four is equal to three. Um, what's the limit as x approaches four uh, from the right? So if I'm approaching 4 from the right hand side, coming in this direction, then I'm moving down along the curve like so. It's a limit value. 3, right? As if I look at what's happening over here along this path, I'm getting closer and closer to 3. Okay. Uh, what happens if I come in from the other side? as I approach from the left hand side. Now I'm over here on this side, so I'm coming up from below now. What's the limit along that path? Three, same, right? Uh, here, over here. Every time I get closer along the curve, the point on the y-axis is moving up towards three. So in this case, uh, the left and the right hand limits are both the same. So this is my limit along the left-hand path. And so what does that mean about the limit as x approaches 4? What is that going to be equal to? Three. Three. As long as the left and right are the same, and that's the same value as the big limit. And again, this is now uh, our typical case. Right. The value of the limit is the same as the function value at the limit point. And that's because on this path there's no holes or gaps. Okay, but of course what's more interesting is what's happening at the point where x is 2. So uh, once again, we're going to make a comparison of these limit values with the function value. In this case, what can you say about f of 2? It's not defined. This would be f of 2. If this were filled in, right, if that circle were filled in, then this would be the function value, what, 2. But by putting an open circle here, what I'm telling you is that this function doesn't have a defined value. I've drawn this function just so f of 2 is undefined. That's always a possibility. Uh, it's the, the, and this is the geometric representation of a function whose value at a point is not defined. I've just left it out. I haven't given a definition to what that function value is. Okay, so this function is not defined at two. Uh, what can we say about the limit? 
So once again, I don't know, let's come in from the left hand side. So put a little minus sign here to show you. This is a one sided limit. What is the value of this limit as x approaches 2 from the left? So I'm coming in along this path on the x axis. Uh, and if I follow that path on the curve, I'm moving in this direction. And that imposes a path along the y axis, like so. What is the value of this limit based on this geometry? Two. two. The closer x gets to two, the closer the function value is getting to two. So the limit from the left hand side is equal to two. What about the limit from the right hand side? Now I'm coming a little bit of ways, getting closer, closer as I move in along the curve. I'm talking about this path, moving downwards towards the point, and once again this imposes motion along the y-axis for the function value. What is the limit from the right hand side going to be? Two. Same. Doesn't matter which direction I come from, the closer x gets to two, the closer the function value gets to two. So here's another example of where the limit value doesn't depend on direction, it's the same from both sides. And so what does that tell me about the big limit? Two. It didn't make any difference whether that hole was there or not. If I'd filled that gap in or filled the hole in, it would have been the same result. Punching a hole in, it didn't change it. What has changed is this. This is not the same as the function value anymore. The function wasn't even defined here. But the limit is equal to 2. So this is a little bit different from the last case. The last case uh, we did, uh, we were able to show that the limit failed to exist at all. Uh, the, the two approaches gave us two different values that forced the limit process to break down and this is the case where the limit does not exist. In this case here the limit does exist but it is no longer equal to its function value. Uh, you know, uh, we saw that here right? when we we're talking about for this function the limit as x approaches 1. That limit was equal to zero, which is the same as the function value. We looked at the, uh, li for this graph, we looked at what happens at four. The limit existed and it was equal to the function value. The difference now is that even though the limit exists, it no longer is the same as the value of the function. So these are two different cases illustrating, uh, in this case, not the breakdown of the limit process, but this deviation. Our typical case, those two things are the same. The value of the function at the limit point and the limit itself are always equal. But here's a geometric illustration of a deviation where the actual value of the function deviates from its limit value. Um, yeah. And finally, uh, here's the last case, a last case that uh, interferes with the limit process. And this is, uh, applies to graphs that have asymptotes. Right, vertical asymptotes. Um, we're going to talk a whole lot more about asymptotes, I guess, next week. Um, but I hope you've seen these before. In pre-calculus, we cover the case of the asymptote. Right, the asymptote is, a, uh, in this case, a vertical line. Uh, what's happening as I approach the graph from uh, one, uh, the two directions, uh, these function values are starting to increase or decrease without bound. Uh, we see this in rational functions, we see this in trigonometric functions, right? The tangent function, the secant function, they have these asymptotes. Uh, any function whose denominator can go to zero potentially has an asymptote at that point. Uh, and so, you know, the same sort of issue arises here. What can we say about the limit? Uh, so for this function um, uh, at, at one, I guess, that's the, that's the issue here. What is the limit as x approaches 1? Uh, let's come in from the right hand side first of this function. Right? What's happening to the function values as x approaches 1 from the right? So the process looks like this. I'm getting closer and closer to the point 1. Uh, and so if I look at what's happening along the path of the curve, then I'm following this path. 
I look at this on uh, how this translates into the y-axis. Looks like this. What's happening to these function values? What are they approaching? Are they approaching anything at all? What can we say here? Infinity. Infinity. Right? They're increasing without bound. The closer I get to one, the further up along the uh, further up along the path of the curve that I get. So th this function isn't really settling down to anything. It's just getting larger and larger. And the closer I get to one, the larger the value gets. And so whenever we have asymptotes. Uh, that's the way we're going to describe the limit value. Um, I'm going to call this limit infinite. Now, there's one sense in which it's appropriate to say this limit doesn't exist. So if I was being really rigid, I would have to include the idea that this limit does not exist because it's not settling down to any finite number. But among the class of limits that don't exist, this is kind of special. This is very different from the case of the uh, gap. Um, so uh, this is the idea of the infinite limit. It's a consequence, uh, a geometric consequence of the asymptote, uh, but we will make that distinction. Uh, even though this limit doesn't strictly exist, it's infinite in a way that that uh, gap case uh, was not. Um, what about from the other direction? What can I say about the limit? I'm closing it in this direction. Now I'm following the path along the curve in this way. So if I look at what's happening along the y-axis, dropping, what do you think we'll say about this limit? Negative infinity. It's getting smaller without bound. It's decreasing without bound. If I, if I you know, consider the, the two ends of the uh, axis here, positive infinity at the top, negative infinity at the bottom, then um, I've got two different approaches depending on which side of the graph I'm on. So from the right-hand side, the function values increase to infinity. Coming from the left, the function values decrease to negative infinity. Uh, and so, you know, what can I say now about the limit as x approaches 1 itself? What are you going to say now? Doesn't exist. Left and right are different. So no matter how I look at it now, uh, this function, this graph here, this limit here, uh, does not exist. Uh, so this is the third case. And these are the three principal cases in which the limit process fails in one way or another, either through the limit itself not existing or uh, the limit value deviating from the function value. These are the pathological cases that we're going to be most interested in and to contribute most to the development of the calculus. Um, now, uh, we w next we're going to talk more about these infinite limits in more detail. Uh, and we're going to see that it is possible that these branches could be going in the same direction. Uh, it's very easy that I could draw a graph with an asymptote in which both sides of the asymptote are going towards positive infinity or both sides are going in the same direction towards negative infinity. In that case, then we would say the big limit itself uh, has one of those infinite values. Uh, but um, in this case, two different directions, no question, this limit fails. Okay, uh, and so uh, there, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the, what the most important thing to take away from all of this, typical case, function value and the limit value are the same thing. Under what conditions does that fail to, uh, to hold? Well, functions with gaps. Anytime a function has a gap within its domain, the limit's going to fail to exist at the point where the gap exists. Uh, functions with holes punched in them in one way or another. Uh, these functions will also, uh, the limit process breaks down not because the limit doesn't exist, it does, but it no longer uh, equals the function value. Uh, and by the way, you know, uh, I could very easily change this in such a way that the function is defined. Uh, suppose I uh, move the point down here. Yeah, so now I've done two things. I've punched a hole in this function and I've moved that point somewhere else. Now what does f of 2 equal? Negative 1. So f of 2 does have a value now, but it's still not equal to the function value. If I, trans if I punch a hole, all I mean eliminate that point altogether, or if I move it somewhere else, the result is still the same. The limit exists, but the um, 
function value is no longer the same as the limit value. And then finally, the asymptote. The infinite behavior around the asymptote, that's the third case in which the limit process can fail. Um, and once again, a uh, summary. Uh, this, uh, I guess we call this our second limit law beyond the evaluation through direct substitution. Uh, the limit exists if and only if the left and right hand limits are equal. If the left, hand, left and right hand equal, limits are equal, then the limit value is equal to that. And if the limit value is equal to some number, then it has to be the case that the left and right hand limits are equal to that same thing. So uh, there's a summarization of that idea. Okay, so there we go. There's um, the geometry of the limit, geometric property of the limit. All of these things can be done by inspection. If you see the graph of a function, you can immediately look at it and say, well, here's a place where the limit fails. Here's a place where the limit exists, but it deviates from the function value. Okay.